guess we're getting ready, ready to get started. Um, thanks for coming. My name is James Weaver. I work for IBM. Um, I'm a quantum developer advocate. Those are my coordinates. And the slides that I'll be presenting are live at the, the URL up there. And um, if you want to follow along, that, that'd be great. There are a lot of resources that I'll be pointing at. Got a couple of blogs, a uh, technical blog at javafexpert.com, and my technology slash music blog is uh, culturedear.com, and I tweet at uh, javafexpert.com. Um, I've written several Java books and um, uh, have, uh, am a Java champion, and I just love speaking about uh, Java and quantum and music, and anytime I can combine those, then that's a, it's a good day. What we're going to be talking about is quantum computing, give you an overview, and I'm going to talk about the relationship between quantum computing and music, and specifically music composition. Then we're going to get deep into some music theory, talking about species counterpoint musical style, and then the, the, the idea of then composing music probabilistically. And there's a link between quantum computing and probabilistic music composition. You've heard of Schrodinger's cat, where the cat's in a box and you don't know whether Schrodinger's cat is uh, alive or dead until you observe and it's based upon probabilities. And so since music composition is based upon probabilities, there are some links there. And we'll have some music composition and, and jamming demos along the way. So we're really kind of uh, at, a, at a point where history is repeating itself. Back in the 1940s, I'm sure none of us were there, but, but uh, computers were brand new. They filled rooms. There was a limited number of bits. And uh, everything was in its infancy. Uh, we were just making stuff up back then. Grace, uh, Admiral Grace Hopper was writing uh, a COBOL compiler for the ENIAC over there. And then here we are today, and we're, we're on this, uh, the cusp of a new era of quantum computing, where computers take whole rooms. They, we have a limited number of quantum bits and we're just making stuff up right now. We're definitely in a research mode. So quantum computers, as it shows on the bottom there, uh, make direct use of quantum mechanical phenomena, such as superposition, and I'll talk about what superposition is, and entanglement, and other properties of quantum mechanics like interference, wave pattern interference. And it uses those things to operate on data rather than what we're used to, which is classical on and off states. This is a, uh, uh, an IBM uh, Q System 1 that we unveiled at C uh, the Computer Electronics Show in Las Vegas in 2019. And um, just kind of wanted, wanted to explore why would we want to use a quantum computer? Well, there, there are problems that can only be solved on quantum computers. So the, out of the whole problem space, there are some that are feasible on classical computers um, and some that will never be feasible on classical computers. They would take thousands of years to run because there are just too many possibilities to run through them classically. Um, so. Uh, and then there's an intersection between those two. There are some problems that are feasible both on classical and quantum computers. But some problems, uh, you just want to be able to run them exponentially faster. And so that's why quantum computing is, is a, um, a really good avenue to explore. So people started getting really excited about quantum computing in about 1994 when Peter Shore published a paper on Shor's algorithm. And what it said that, that we can do some of the algorithm for computing prime factors of numbers exponentially faster. So RSA encryption, which counts on the, uh, counts on the fact that factoring a two or three or 400 digit number is very hard and would take, you know, could take hundreds of years to do. Um, that's what makes RSA secure. But if we can do that in 
minutes or hours even, then we can break RSA security. And so uh, the idea of being able to do things quantumly that we, can't, we can only dream of doing classically uh, made everybody excited about it. And then in 1995, Love Grover came up with Grover's algorithm, which uh, has to do with uh, unstructured search and being able to do that quadratically faster. So if you had um, a million records, then it would only take, rather than 500,000 queries to an oracle, it would only take the square root of one million, which is 1,000 uh, queries to the oracle. So that, that scales up pretty well. And uh, kind of originally, uh, Dr. Richard Feynman challenged us to create a, a quantum computer. And uh, he was very interested in this, this idea because he wanted to be able to simulate nature. He said, if you want to be able to simulate nature, for example, to do drug discovery or uh, you know, chemical compound modeling, perhaps to feed you know, the planet more efficiently, um, if you want to be able to simulate nature, then you're going to have to do that quantum mechanically because nature isn't classical. And so he basically challenged us to build a quantum computer that would then simulate nature. And uh, if anybody watched The Big Bang Theory, watch that. Okay, so over on the right, you recognize that Sheldon. Well, in one of the episodes, he, Sheldon played the bongos, and that was uh, just an, an homage. He was kind of honoring Dr. Richard Feynman because, because Richard Feynman used to like to play the bongos to relax. And so one of the things, even though our current quantum computers have a small number of qubits, and those qubits are noisy, um, we, we can still do some very useful things with those. And in about three to five years, we're projecting that we'll be able to do things quantumly uh, that we can't do, that, you, that we can actually do faster uh, classically that are useful problems like for example areas of machine learning and chemistry modeling nature and some optimization problems like logistical problems you've you've heard um, undoubtedly of the traveling salesman problem uh, when you add so many destinations there becomes so many combinations that um, it would take too long to, to run through all of those classically by brute force. But with quantum algorithms, uh, it can um, uh, search through that and, and you can have much fewer queries to the oracle for that particular problem. And then also modeling finance. When you have a portfolio of, um, of so many variables, uh, you could use quantum computer t to analyze your portfolio. But one thing that's missing off of this is music composition and improvisation. Now, that's something that, that's near and dear to my heart. And music and quantum mechanics are both, as I've said, probabilistic. Uh, here's a quote by Leonard B. Mar Meyer in Music and the Arts. And he said that once a musical style has become part of the habit responses of composers and performers and practice listeners, it may be regarded as a complex system of probabilities. So if you think about a musical style that you like, and uh, you can kind of, as you're listening to it, sometimes when you hear one note or a series of notes, you can anticipate what the next note might be or some of the possibilities. And so, um, they're probabilistic. And so to inaccurately pray, uh, paraphrase Dr. Feynman, bongo music isn't classical. And if you want to make a simulation of music, you better make it quantum mechanical. So the big idea then is to ask a quantum computer to compose music. And the musical style I chose was, uh, w was a style that was actually invented or, you know, became uh, of age in the 1600s. And it's called Species Counterpoint. And so I want to play a, a little bit of just typical Species Counterpoint for you.
So if you listen to that, you'll notice that um, it's got two different voices, and the top voice has a, has a melody, and notice that the melody, uh, the notes, rise and fall in pitch, and also the bottom voice, the bottom line, has a melody, it's a counter melody, and it rises and falls. So you can see that each one of those are rising and falling in pitch independently, but, um, but those voices are, are interdependent in that they need to sound good when played together. So I'll go ahead and play it again, and please notice that the top, the top and the bottom melodies are rising and falling in pitch, but whenever two notes are played together, they sound pleasing to the ear. So it was invented in, uh, in the 16th century by Giovanni Palestrina, and um, then a, a gentleman with a very awkward last name, Johann Josef Fuchs, uh, later in Austria, um, he codified Palestrina's techniques. Uh, he did that in a book called Gratis Ad Parnassum, which means stairway to the, mu to the muses or something. And in this book, he... Uh, in, you know, in the description of the book or in the, the text of the book, he came up with about 70 rules for counterpoint, species style counterpoint music. And so those rules then can be, um, if you, in algorithmic composition, they could be leveraged in, in, uh, in compositions. So, uh, so what I did was I just took a few of those rules and I wrote a program that then has a quantum computer do what it does best, which is probab probabilistic, uh, um, you know, uh, measurement. And um, I used that idea then to compose music using some of Johann's, uh, the rules that Johann documented. So here's a screenshot of the application. And, uh, at the, and it's in, available in GitHub. It's open source, Apache 2 licensed. And um, the heart of the application is this transition matrix. And I'll zoom in on here. Uh, so one of the transition matrices can express melodic characteristics. So what I mean by that is if a note is playing, then the next note, what, are, was, what is the probability of different notes playing? And so in this transition matrix, I can influence that. So. Here, for example, um, if I have a D playing over here on the, in, the col in, the, in the rows, then I could say, you know, I want a 0.29 probability that the next note will be an E. And so I just put that in the matrix. All of these rows add up to one, all of these columns add up to one, so I have a probability of one. And so the way that sounds, here's a D, here's a D, and then the next note, there's a 0.29 probability that it'll be an E. So you can hear the D followed by the E. And that, um, that agrees with some of the uh, rules of species counterpoint, mostly stepwise motion, but with some, some leaps, and then the tendency for melodies to move by a descending step. So here, if we've got a D, then I want to, I'm saying that there's a 0.5 probability that I want that next note to be a C. And so that's for melodies, when one note follows another. But harmonies, when two notes are playing together, I've got another transition matrix. And here, I'll just go ahead and play a little sound of two notes being played together. And uh, that's an interval that is consonant. It is pleasing to the ear. And here's the, the, the harmony matrix. And I'm saying, okay, for example, if I'm playing an F, there's an F, then I want a one probability, 100% probability that the next note, or that the, the note being played with it will be a D. So there's a D. And um, so, 
With that in mind then, what does quantum have to do with anything? And so what I'm doing here then is every note pitch I'm representing with a, a quantum state, a, a qubit, a quantum bit. And so here we have the C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C, the, the, the C scale for those of you uh, musicians. Um, and each one then represented by a quantum note. So that's how we represent pitches. And then how we represent these transition matrices, so the transitions between you know, melodic transitions where one note follows another and which note is gonna be played or even or harmonic transitions, those are both represented. Those matrices that I showed you are represented with a unitary matrix. So here we have a quantum pitch C and then we've got a unitary matrix, and then it evolved into a D. And so that's the, the heart of what we'll be doing here. So I need to tell you a little bit about quantum states and, and quantum, quantum bits and quantum mechanics. And so we're gonna kind of dive into that a little bit. And so um, here I'm representing two quantum states. And normally, when somebody teaches you about uh, quantum states and quantum computing, they're going to use qubits. And that C, that would be a zero, and that D, that would be a one. Um, but we're using notes, so I'm just going to use C and D. So here we have a two-dimensional vector space, just a, just a plain, you know, two-dimensional plane here. And on the x-axis, or the C-axis, we've got the, the note C, and on the y-axis, or the d-axis, we've got the note D. That circle, that's a unit circle. So that is one unit away from the, the center of the, um, the vector space there. Okay, you with me so far? Any questions so far? Okay, everybody, we got it. Okay, now, how do we represent the C on a, a two-dimensional vector space? Well, we use a vector. So that one zero up there, that's just simply a, a vector, which, you know, for Java programmers that, you know, you might relate that to a single dimensional array. So the top number is on the C axis there, and the, the bottom number is on the, the D axis, so it's one zero. And we're representing that with a C, and that funny looking notation with the pipe symbol on the left and the, the right angle bracket on the right, that's called a ket. And that's part of a, a notation uh, invented by physicist Dr. Paul Dirac. And it's called Dirac notation and this part of it is called a ket. So sometimes you'll hear that being referred to as a ket. So what would the vector be that represents the D? Somebody tell me the two numbers in the vector that would represent the D to prove that you're tracking with me. Zero one. Zero one, very good. Very good, very binary, this is awesome. Okay, so now we've got this other state. So, so far we've, you know, we've got classical states, but now we're gonna get into quantum states and superpositions. So with quantum states, you know, it could be zero or one, or in this case, C or D, or it could be in any superposition of those two. Any, you know, superposition sounds kind of like a, a really mysterious word. It's really, in algebra terms, it's really just a, a linear combination. It's some combination of C and D. In this case, I'm pointing to a combination of C and D that lives on the unit vector. All quantum states, all pure quantum states live on that unit vector. And notice that it's got some um, amplitude in the C direction and some amplitude in the D direction, okay? So those are called probability amplitudes. And so the, the hypotenuse of that triangle then points to that quantum state which is some combination of C and D. Okay, so the way that we would represent that quantum state is on the bottom there. And so we, uh, we represent that as the root over one-third 
C and the root over or the, the root of uh, two thirds D. So the reason why we're doing that is the the length there, the amplitude there is root over one third, and the, the height is is root over two thirds. And then you could also use Dirac notation here, where we're putting the coefficient in front of it, root over one third C plus root over two thirds D. And that simply means root over one third amplitude on the C direction, and then plus just means the plus direction we're going up, right, in, in the vector space. So root over two thirds D, and that's where that, that is. So when we measure that, when we look at Schrodinger's cat, you know, when we measure this quantum state, there's gonna be some probability that we're gonna see the C and there's going to be some probability that it will collapse to a D. So I haven't told you how to compute the probability, but I've given you some information there, and you could probably maybe take a guess at what the probabilities would be. Let's say, what is the probability? What do you think the probability is that when we measure it, it'll be a C? The square of... Uh, the. Uh, it'll be one-third because the, the amplitude, if we just think of Pythagorean theorem, we know that that's a right triangle. And if we know that the, that the hypotenuse, you know, the, the, uh, the, hy the square root of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares, um, then we, we see that um, the, the square of the root of one-third is one-third. And this, the square of the root of two-thirds is, is two-thirds. So, um, so the, the probabilities then, of course, all have to add up to one. So conveniently, one-third plus two-third is one. So when I measure this quantum state, there's a one-third probability that it will be a C and a two-thirds probability that it will be a D. Okay, so any questions on that point? Are we clear on that point? Okay, that, that works? Okay, good. Would that, okay, the, the question is, um, would that be a C sharp? That, that's a good one. It, it would actually be a C plus plus, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, so how do we modify these transition matrices? So we want to be able to control the probabilities. So in the application, um, I've got uh, I've got some the transition matrices, and I've got a UI that I'll show you in a second, to where we can m manipulate those probabilities. So here, let's say I manipulated. I'm just working with C and D now. So I manipulated the probabilities to make it so that it's the same as that diagram I just showed you. So here, the probability for C moving to staying at C is one third. And for D moving to C is, um, is two-thirds. So that's the probabilities. And then over on the right are the probability amplitudes. You remember the, the probability amplitudes of root of one-third and root of two-thirds? So, um, so the process then, and I'll show you the application in a second. In fact, I'll go ahead and show, that, show it now. The process of doing that is, uh, for this particular one, is doing this slider which controls the probability from C to D. So I'm going to make the slider go to about uh, the same state that I just had. So let's see, C to C is about 33% and C to D is about 67%. As a matter of fact, I can go ahead and compose a song right now using these probabilities. So we have uh, those probabilities set up and we can look at the harmony matrices. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. I just wanna deal with melodies right now. And then I'll go to this jam on tab and I'll click melody. And what, what that'll do then is that's gonna go to the, actually the quantum computing simulator and it's gonna load a quantum circuit in there that represents the transition probabilities that I, that I desired. And it came back then with a string 
that, uh, that I can paste into um, some musical scoring software. There we go. So I'm going to paste that or cut, copy that and paste it into uh, some software. And it's going to then, it, it then sh is showing us what it just composed. And the composition only has C's and D's in it, right? Because that's all that we supplied transition probabilities for. So we start with a C, and then there was some probability that it was going to either, you know, a D would follow a C or a C would follow a C, et cetera. And so we could listen to our composition then by just hitting play. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and play that again since it wasn't very loud. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the, our first composition. So the process then of composing the music then is we start out with a C and then we, we take it through a unitary uh, transformation, a unitary matrix, and then that's going to end up in some superposition like I just showed you. But then when we measure it, there's going to be some probability that it will be a C, and as, as we said, the particular quantum state we, we put it in, there's a one-third pro one probability that it will collapse as a C. And so let's say we get a C. Then we're going to run it through another unitary matrix. It's going to end up in a superposition. We'll, we'll take a measurement. But let's say that instead it, it collapsed to a D. Well, we, we still are going to do another transition, another gate, unitary matrix, and it ends up in a superposition that we measure. And we do that until our composition is done. And so that's why we got some composition like this. So if we were going to compose a whole song, then, which I'll show you in a second, we, we start out with a C here. I'm, I'm choosing the bass clef to, to, to do the C. And then we apply a unitary matrix to get the next note. And here we're using actually four pitches, but a unitary matrix to get the next note. And then to get the, the, the note that's playing at the same time, we're going to use the unitary matrix that we, that we desired for harmony notes. And so that gives us this note. And then for, for, this, for the top melody, then we're going to do another unitary matrix for the next note of the melody. And then we just do that until our uh, composition is complete. Now, C, D, E, and F are represented by four different quantum states. And those quantum states we're representing with 0, 0 for C, 0, 1 for D, etc. Just the binary progression. But we're enclosing them in kets so that we know that these are quantum states. And then we take uh, the results, like if, uh, if we're starting out with C, then we're going to take the quantum bits or the qubits that we're using to represent C, we take the, the least significant qubit, which is the one on the right here, and we use that input to the quantum circuit here. And then we'll take the, the, the most significant qubit and we put it on the, the bottom wire of this circuit. And then we let it go through these, these gates that we've defined that, that, are, uh, that are defined according to the, our desired transitions in this case, uh, melodic transitions, let's say. Um, and then it's going to uh, be loaded into the, co the quantum computer and then measured. And that's how we get each note. Questions so far? You still with me? Awesome. OK. OK, good. Yes? Oh, OK. So the question is, are the, uh, the, the values of the, of the length of the notes, are they set? And um, uh, so, yes, there are, there are, in this iteration of the software, 
there are uh, four, five species of counterpoint that, that we support. And in, um, in the species that you're looking at here, for example, um, that's species two, I think, where you've got one note at the bottom for every two notes in the counter melody. And, um, and there are other uh, species that you can select that then are uh, more, more fluid, more uh, changing as far as the rhythms. And um, I think on a future iteration of this software, I'm going to add a third transition matrix for the duration of notes so that that can be probabilistic as well. That's a very good question. So here's just an example of, uh, of a composition that, that I did on a real quantum computer rather than a simulator. Uh, we've got uh, a 16-bit, 16 16-qubit 16 quantum computer in Melbourne, Australia. And so that's just uh, another example. But we could go ahead and, and create our own melody here. I'm going to go back to the melody matrices. And, um, you know, I could rotate all of these different uh, axes here from one note to another, C to D, C to E. Or I could go to some presets. I found some interesting combinations that I like, and I went ahead and noted what the angles were for these different rotations, and I just put them in presets. So one that follows some of the rules of counterpoint, um, I put in a preset called counterpoint, and so those are the probabilities, and these are the probability amplitudes. And then for harmony, I'll go ahead and turn harmony back on, and for that I'm going to use the preset of consonant. So they all are going to sound good. I've got 100% probability that I'll either get, in musical terms, uh, major thirds or minor sixths, which are both consonant intervals. And we'll go to jam on, and I'll, sp I'll select species three counterpoint, and it'll, it'll go ahead and go through that process that I just showed you, and I'll copy and paste the resultant string. Let's see. I don't know whether I actually copied copied it. Let me let me do that again. Copy and paste the resultant string into our musical scoring software here. And so there's our composition. And I could play it now and we can hear what it sounds like. So it's, you know, the rules of counterpoint sounds pleasing to the ear. And so now, um, so we've shown that we can represent qubits with a two-dimensional vector space, just a plane that has, you know, the two dimensions on it. We've shown that we can represent it with, in Dirac notation, as linear combinations. And there's another way of representing it that I wanted to expose you to just, just because you'll see this in the wild and I, I wanted to show this to you. But it's called the block sphere. And it gives an extra dimension to it because in, with quantum states, those probability amplitudes like the root of one third, those can be real numbers, but they can also be complex numbers. So they can have an imaginary component to them. And that imaginary component uh, can be represented on the, on the imaginary plane, which is, uh, which is represented on the equator of the block sphere. So, the, so the, the equator of the block sphere is actually the imaginary plane of the complex number. And the, the complex component of a probability amplitude is very useful for quantum algorithms because um, because they can um, define the wave, right? The, the actual phase of the quantum state then controls the, the wave pattern. And so you can have uh, various components of a quantum state that each are on their own wave pattern and they, they can constructively and destructively interfere with each other. Um, and so uh, one of the the main ideas behind creating a quantum algorithm 
is that you want to set up a quantum state. You choreograph a quantum state so that those, those interference patterns uh, constructively interfere to your desired answer, and they destructively interfere, canceling out the wrong answers. And so that's, that's the heart of how quantum algorithms work. So in this presentation, I've got a link to a, a, a visualization that I created for visualizing a block sphere. So here, we've got the zero state. Remember in, in, our, um, in our application, that would be the C state, right? And then the D state was the one state. So I'm gonna go over here now and, and uh, talk about zero and one. And we've got then anywhere on that block sphere, anywhere on the surface of that sphere is a valid quantum state. And, um, and so just projecting then, because the equator is the complex plane, I'm just showing down here a projection of the complex plane so that we can see as we change the quantum state. Maybe I apply a particular gate to the quantum state here and I can see it start to move and um, maybe another gate, a phase gate. And so you can see the projection down there as the phase of the quantum state changes. The projection on the left is the probability. So it maps directly to, geometrically, to the block sphere. Um, as I uh, do uh, gates on this, this quantum state here, like this uh, uh, rotate X gate, as the, the position, the quantum state, gets higher on the sphere, notice the probability of zero increases. Okay, so it maps directly, the projection maps directly. So we can get good visual intuitions on the block sphere of the quantum state and what the resultant probabilities are going to be as well as the phases useful for interference patterns. And then at the top then we have the Dirac notation that, that expresses this quantum state. So I've landed at, at one which uh, expresses the quantum state of the probability amplitude being the root of 0.85 on, on the zero axis and the, the probability amplitude being the root of 0.15 on the uh, one axis. And then this e to the i, you know, pi over two, all that does is that expresses the phase. So it's a, just a notation, e to the i, and then some angle is just a notation that expresses some rotation. In this case, um, it, uh, so, so pi is, is 180 degrees. Uh, on a circle, it's always 180 degrees. So pi over two is just 90 degrees. So all this is saying is there's a, um, a 90 degree rotation in the phase, okay? With me so far? Everybody okay? That's incredible. You guys, are, you guys are doing really well. Okay, so as a matter of fact, you're doing so well that I'm, I'm gonna do a little housekeeping. Um, I, I skipped a step. I always get a, a picture of the audience. And um, the reason I do that is because my boss has um, uh, kind of trust issues. I've only worked for IBM <laughs> for four months. And so she really doesn't believe that I actually show up and, and speak places unless I take a selfie with the audience. So, um, and, you know, I'm new, so I want to make sure that she knows that the audience is having a good time. So I always, you know, I, I would like to humbly ask you to strike a crazy pose when I, when I, when I hit the camera, okay? So I'm, no, I mean, I'm serious. I, I, you know, my paycheck depends on it. So I'm going to say... I'm going to say one, two, three, and crazy pose, and then I just want you to do a really crazy pose. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. All right. One, two, three, crazy pose. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm going to tweet this, by the way. So, <laughs> so if you've told somebody that you're going to be somewhere else, um, you might start thinking about excuses at this point. Okay, so... 
Um, so if you want to play with a real quantum computer or even a simulator and you want to do it in the style of, of um, dragging gates over to circuits, then you could use the IBM Q quantum experience and that's, that's this link, there's a composer. And then um, uh, as you're dragging gates to circuits, then it's actually then creating this assembly language, this quantum assembly language called CASM. And so you can, yeah, really, nice, nice name for it. And so you could, uh, you, could, you could have it generate CASM or you could actually um, you know, type in the CASM yourself. And then your, it supports experimentation. So you can then run your experiment and then it will give you some results. So it, it'll take, you know, if you wanted to do it, could uh, maybe take a thousand measurements and then you'll get some statistical, uh, you know, some uh, probability distribution based upon the probabilities that you've encoded into your quantum state. Um, so then Qiskit is an open source framework that we've created for being able to program quantum computers. So there's uh, various, there's four pieces of quiz, Qiskit. One is called Terra, which is foundational libraries. It, it, uh, it allows you to create gates and circuits and, and do measurements. It's also got something called, uh, and here's an example, by the way, of Qiskit. You, you program it in Python, so we're doing some imports and we're, we're, we're defining a, a quantum register and a classical register and a quantum circuit. The reason why we do the classical register is when we measure, we want to be able to measure it into something that we can uh, read with a classical program. So um, here we're, we're creating those things and then we're putting some gates. Um, like for example, we're putting an H gate on the top wire, we see there. And then we're putting a C naught gate, that's a CX gate, uh, next. Uh, what that is, is that's a conditional knot, by the way. So the dot there is the condition, and then that, uh, that symbol that we see on the second wire right here is the knot. So if this wire is one, qubit one, then this wire will flip. So if it's initialized as zero, then it'll flip to being a one. And so it works out in logic like being an XOR, an exclusive OR. And, um, and then we take some measurements, measure them into the classical registers, and uh, we're off. You know, we can then measure it and see what the results are. Sample output here. We, we're going to get zero, zero, uh, you know, about half the time, and one, one, about half the time. And just as an aside, this particular state that we've created here is called the Bell state, to where, uh, to where um, uh, you notice if we measure the first qubit, then we know that the second qubit is going to be zero, because there's a 100% probability that if the, if the first one is zero, the second one is zero. So that, that's how you create a bell state, or one of the four bell states. Um, and so, we also have aqua, which, uh, which we use then to create these higher level algorithms. So you, can, you could be a chemist, or you could be somebody in logistics, or, or somebody in finance, and you could use these higher level quantum computing algorithms with, without having to know anything about quantum computing. You just use the APIs and then underneath it realizes the algorithms and creates the circuits. And so those are again machine learning, chemistry, optimization, and finance. And so I wanted to end with, uh, um, with kind of a, a musical demonstration and um, back in the 70s, anybody remember Close Encounters of the First, the Third Kind? Anybody heard of it? Okay, so, um, so I've always loved that movie, and it's kind of a musical movie because in order to communicate with the aliens, they ended up playing music to the alien spacecraft, and the alien collaborated with them, and so they ended up jamming with this with the spacecraft. And the alien spacecraft in the movie 
really, don't you think, looks suspiciously like an IBM quantum computer. <laughs> it really does, right? And so in the movie then, uh, the, the, uh, the engineer, the, the Philip Dodd, who is now is deceased, but um, he was playing a synthesizer, and the, the display for the synthesizer is, um, is over there on the, the left. And that looks suspiciously like an instrument that I play. And actually, uh, Geert Bevan, as some of you may know him, he actually demonstrated this instrument uh, a couple of years ago at, at, at Ye Focus. And so, um, so I thought, well, you know, I'll put together a demonstration to where I play uh, this instrument, and then the quantum computer jams with me. And so, um, you know, it was worth, it was a lot of fun. So, I mean, it's fun, you may as well do it, right? So, so what, uh, what I did then was um, I put a button on here in which I can generate some jam notes. And what that does is that, that uses those melodic and harmonic transitions um, and it does it many, many times, sending a C to it and a D to it and an E to it and just generating all sorts of things that it's caching up uh, based upon those probabilities. So it's as if we're in real time you know, composing music but I'm caching them up now when I, I'm going to hit jam notes and, and, and cache them up. And, um, and so then as I play, it's going to, it's going to uh, use those then to respond to what I'm playing. So it'll be kind of jamming with me. If you're familiar with uh, you know, having a jam session with other musicians, um, the idea is maybe you play, you play a few notes, the other musicians play a few notes, and you kind of do this call response thing back and forth. And while you're doing it, the notes that you play, the other musician is going to try to play something that's a little bit in line with it and then makes it so that it's easy for you to respond. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the idea. So we'll, we'll go ahead and see if this works here. Now, when I play something, it's going to sound like a piano. And when the, com the quantum computer plays something, it's going to sound like a nylon string guitar. And so, um, and I, I do have four, uh, actually six jam note modes here. The jam mode four means that I'm going to play four notes and then the quantum computer will play four notes. So let's see, I'm going to hit jam note four and then I'm going to play four notes. Let's see what four notes. Okay, do we have the sound up? Okay. Anyway, that's my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. So, thank you. So we have a couple minutes for questions. Any questions? We have one minute for questions. Any questions? Yes, question. Uh, we, we showed a piece of music that was generated by an actual quantum computer. Any chance we'll get to hear that? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't keep it. <laughs> but do you, are you good at sight uh, singing? Okay, because, you know, it's, if we've got two people that could do two-part harmony and sight sing really well, I could put it up there and then you could... Uh... Okay, all right, all right. Doesn't say I didn't offer. Yes. Jam the notes from the film. Okay, already I'll do that for you. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> this should be fun.
<laughs> there you go. Thank you.